a decisive moment which refers to capturing an event that is ephemeral and spontaneous and where the image ends up representing the essence of the event itself. Um, so the question is, uh, does the decisive moment apply to drone photography? And that's something that you can sort of um, store in the background there and have a little bit of a think about. As a landscape photography, if you're capturing storms rolling through and you know the changing landscape and the changing light and the light just before sunset and capturing that perfect moment just before sunset and waiting for the golden light to hit the peak that you've been waiting for all day, um, then... Uh, uh, it's it's some, it, there's an ephemeral nature about what we're trying to capture, and then it's a question of how um, how uh, and whether that moment can repeat be repeated, and whether if you've missed capturing it, it's gone forever. Um, and uh, as his little quote says here, you know, we as photographers deal in things which are continually vanishing, uh, and when they have vanished, there's no contrivance on earth which can make them come back again. We can't go and develop and print a memory. Uh, so we've either got to have captured it uh, or got it on a, on a plate in his day or in, in our days we've got to have the disc with the image on it to do something with it. A modern, you know, contemporary version of, of you know, the frozen moment, the, uh, you know, that decisive moment. These are a couple of images from uh, Warren Keelan. Um, so a few of us uh, know Warren. Warren's based down in Wollongong, fantastic surf photographer. And uh, here he is. I know in the bottom image, I was chatting to him about that, he's taken it at uh, 12 hundredth of a second uh, to just capture the, uh, the foam from the, the wave as it's running up the beach, flip-flopping along and freezing it, um, and also just sort of freezing that moment as the wave is breaking. Um, so so the, the question again arises, are, are these the sorts of images that drones are, are best at? Um, or are these um, a, uh, a, a different uh, thing that you would do with a different genre of photography? So um, one of the things, I suppose, if we go back to these, is that time is frozen. The question in photography and the question in art and the question in all sorts of, of visual imagery is what do you do with time? All right, so you either... So photography is not very good at dealing with time because you know because of shutter speeds and the high speeds that we've got it tends to freeze time so so photography is really suited to capturing the moment and freezing time uh, that bottom image there with the uh, the flip-flop of the foam uh, from the uh, the surface that's running up it's, it's not something you see all the time and it's got its wow factor because it's it's frozen that moment and that particular combination of foam droplets is never going to repeat again, so it's got a uniqueness about it. And I suppose if he had his continuous shutter on, uh, or if he had his camera on continuous mode, he's probably got half a dozen images either side of that, of when the, uh, the foam's flipping and flopping up the beach and he's selected the one that he thinks is the best. So, so the question is, um, I suppose, which, which this draws out is, um, what do you do with time? And uh, is drone photography something where, where time can be accommodated, whereas a more traditional sort of photography, you tend to try to freeze time. So, so coining uh, David Hockney's approach, he, he uses a term called lived time. And his contention is that our memories and our perceptions, they, they have to have a time component because we move through a space or when you're talking to someone, you see people's expressions come and go and your perception of reality and your engagement with the reality has a certain time component which is necessary to make sense of your uh, engagements right? or, or your interactions. So today, you know, in, back in when Bresson was doing his photography, getting an image, that was it. You had your shot, you had your go, that was it. These days, it's as if we live in the continuous moment. Because we've got action replays, you know, take a football, watching the football on Friday night, you know, the guy scoring next to the post, you know, six different angles from the camera, all replayed, uh, you know, so, so the decisive moment, scoring the try, it's, it's no longer a single fleeting image because it's captured it in so many different ways. Even the line calls at Wimbledon, was it in, was it out, did he see what he saw, you know, so, so, so you can actually contest the decisive moment now.
All right? so, so the significance of capturing and freezing the moment, we're now living in different times because of technology. And as I suggested before with, with Warren capturing those waves rolling up the beach, even a wildlife photographer, they all shoot on continuous mode. The new Sony A1 shoots at, what, 30 frames a second? All right. So you've got 30 frames every second. You put your finger down when the bird's flying past. Somewhere in your 500 photos, you're going to have one. And you're going to probably have half a dozen of them. And you're not only just going to have one decisive moment, you've collected about half a dozen of them, and then you've actually got to choose between decisive moments. All right. So, that, so the nature of photography has changed since... Bresson came up with his, with his, his frozen moment. All right? And I think if we're looking at image making, then we've now got the flexibility to either, you know, you can choose your decisive moment or you can choose to incorporate time. How do you incorporate time? And that's the sort of challenge for a photographer. And here we've, we've got an example. All right? So David Hockney, some of you may or may not know, uh, but he went through this stage where he used Polaroid photographs, took lots of them, put them together as collages, and then uh, conveyed concepts. All right. So, so in this one, his concept is trying to uh, include time in what is a frozen moment. All right. So he he has um, taken different photos, different times, blended those together to try to get a sense of movement, sense of motion, and a sense of time which is not something that is easily incorporated in a photograph. Yeah? So, so this is David's attempt at doing it. If we look at someone like Picasso, um, you might have looked at these, these weird images of Picasso and think, well, you know, they're just distortions. But what he's trying to do is incorporate time in what is a traditional media that doesn't have time. All right, so... so so if you're standing um, or sitting looking at a person and you're having a cup of coffee with them, over time they turn their face, you'll see a profile, you'll see them front on, you'll see them smile. So what he's doing in this image is not trying to distort the person per se. What he's trying to do is incorporate a number of different facets of that person whilst he's engaging with them to tell a bigger story and, uh, and actually incorporate time in the making of the artwork. All right, so, so this image issue he's trying to deal with, and the same what a lot of Cubist painters did, was to deal with time and how do you incorporate time into your images and whether you want to. And um, more recently, most photographers, we love a long exposure. We love to blur the water. We love to get the cascading silk. And why do we like to do that? All right, my, my, my take on it is that it's a way of introducing time into an image, all right? because by, by having the long exposure, you get the sense of the movement, and movement is something going somewhere over time. Yeah? So, so that, so that the, one of the, the attributes of a long exposure, which I think we, we like, is that it, it's more than the frozen moment. All right? it, actually, it, actually engage, it actually has a sense of time about it. So here we are, we've, we're somewhere between freezing time and, um, and a long exposure. The, the next thing we can do um, as a drone photographer, um, we might have the concept of water, moving water, we go to the beach, we do our sunrise shot, but instead of doing a long exposure, we, uh, with a drone, you, now, you have a different way where you can actually engage with movement, all right, with time, with the subject, all right? So you, you can now produce an entrancing um, uh, uh, image, which has all the movement in it. You can watch the water come and go. You can watch the draw. Um, you don't have to be, um, you know, the technology is now with us where we can actually explain uh, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing um, and, uh, and just the, uh, the the lovely motion and the different patterns and the like that you you capture uh, in a moving image, right? but, the, but the nature of the drone as the device that we use to capture it means that we can get our camera into places that previously were pretty difficult to get to. All right, so we've got the freedom to be able to 
take a camera, go, you know, five or ten metres, well, this is probably only about three or four, three or four metres up above the rock platform, and just capture uh, that entrancing continual flow of the ocean over the rock, over the rock pools, and just the patterns that are created and the motion and the sense of, uh, you know, the sense of, uh, of movement that you get as the water moves between those rocks. So then you have the ability to capture not only the movement, but also the sound. One of the things that you'll see in this as it draws back is that even a drone with a one inch sensor has a, uh, a dynamic range issue because the whites start to burn out. So you can see that as it, uh, as it pulls away from the, uh, from the scene, then the whites just tend to lose all that detail. So we're able to, um, we've now got a tool which wasn't available to our man of the decisive moment to actually incorporate time into an image. We've got the movie, but we've got the drone and the drone gives us the ability to, to get that camera and to do different things with the images that it collects. So one of the, uh, the tra traditional things that are, you might use a camera for are landscapes. So I've just got a few uh, images here which, uh, which show you what you can do with a drone with a landscape. All right, so so this, was, this was pretty close to when lockdown started. All right, so Robin and I had headed out west. We are actually heading out to the Flinders Ranges and we, we stopped for a few days in Broken Hill. It was pretty hot while we were there. I think it got to 43, 43 at Broken Hill. And one of the great things to do was to actually sit in the car because the air conditioning was pretty good. Uh, so I went for a drive about half an hour, or maybe an hour, out of uh, Broken Hill on the road to Tipperborough. And on the road to Tipperborough, this storm started to build, the dust started rolling in from the, uh, the west. I was able to throw the drone up into this maelstrom and actually capture the moment. All right, so in some ways you could argue that this is a... Uh, a decisive moment you know it is the uh, capturing the moment but this is something that the drone is fantastic at doing uh, because you wouldn't want to fly your light plane through that and I can tell you that uh, that dust storm was coming in pretty quickly and when I dropped the drone immediately from uh, where it was at this point and I caught it out the car door just as the storm hit all right so uh, so it was pretty uh, finely tuned the uh, the recovery process um, but isn't it a fantastic event? All right? And if I'm down at road level, uh, there's no way that I can get that sense of the, um, uh, the weather rolling across the, uh, the countryside. The thing that really attracted me to this was just the various pockets of rain. All right? So usually in the city, you, know, you just get the sense of the rain coming through, there's a storm and it's gone. But when you're in the big, wide, uh, open uh, landscape, you've got this, the sense of the, uh, the pockets of... Uh, of uh, storms actually moving around and, uh, and you just get the sense of it washing across. You know, it's a bit like a, you know, a Turner painting or you know, any of those sort of, um, sort of romantic era uh, paintings where you've got that sense of the, uh, the light and the, uh, and the weather moving over the landscape. Uh, we've got another one here um, which kind of shows the difference of what you can do with a drone. So this is the... Uh, the black sand beach at Reynasfara in Iceland. And the usual thing you do, um, if, the, if the surf's not too big, you'll work your way around to the point, get the shot of the sea stacks, and uh, try to make a bit of a composition out of it. <laughs> so that's the picture on the left, and that's about as far as we could get around that day because the, the waves are pretty wild and they're a bit rogue, so they, they tend to, uh, uh, to wash in without much notice, and uh, a few people have been caught and dragged out. The image on the right is the drone shot. All right, so what I can do is I can get my camera uh, up into a position halfway up the cliff and then I can uh, pick my composition more. So I can then isolate that first lot of sea stacks from the edge of the, uh, the land. Uh, I can drop the horizon. So at the moment, 
our normal disposition of walking on the land. The horizon is usually pretty close to the bottom of things. Uh, but by pitching up the, uh, the drone, I get to a higher position and I can actually play with composition. So what the drone enables me to do is to um, be a little bit more creative with composition because it's, it's the one I use has got a one inch sensor. So it's got a, a 20 megapixel image, can get it up to 40 megapixels without too much trouble. Um, so you've got something with lots of information that you can uh, you can play with and uh, and edit away. But it just shows you just a, a little subtlety of, uh, of what the drone can achieve in a landscape. And you can do these sorts of things. So the very popular shots with, which you see on lots of Instagram, especially on the with the Sydney boys, is up and down the coast. They're visiting all the sea pools. Mona Vale Pool gets a big mention. Um, this is up at uh, Pearl Beach. And this was taken just after lockdown started. So um, uh, it kind of was a, a nice... These two ladies were doing their social distance thing in the pool. They were keeping apart, swimming in separate lanes. So it was a nice little uh, opportunity to... Uh, to capture something which is uh, sort of of the moment. So, as I say, that was up at Pearl Beach. And you, the, the thing with which the drone really lends itself to is um, the straight down vertical shot. And as with everything, um, we're always trying to look with uh, new eyes, trying to find a different angle, trying to find a different way to see things that we see regularly. Um, and this is a way to see a swimming pool, uh, which is not the usual sort of way you see it. Because then you can treat it, you know, like a Mondrian. You can you can basically treat it as a series of shapes, and you can then uh, populate your canvas uh, with the different shapes, and you can move the drone around and play around with the patterns. And we'll see that in uh, a little bit of footage I've got a little bit later on. And you can do this sort of thing. So this was out at uh, this is at Sea Lake at the salt mine at Sea Lake, the uh, Cheatham Salt Works. And isn't this a great capture of the hand of man right the blade uh, sort of uh, moving across the uh, the surface of the land creating its patterns um, so you you get to uh, just to engage with, uh, with what man's up to in a different way you can actually see it all becomes clear you know when you're down at ground level you can't see the uh, uh, what he's up to over the hill you get yourself onto a drone and it's uh, it's a it's a great revealer but it's also uh, a great uh, tool to, as I say, play with your abstract compositions. So abstraction. So one of the other things to think about is we use the word abstract quite a bit, but if you think about it, abstracts with a drone are really extraction, not abstraction. You know, it's a bit pedantic, but if you abstract something, you take the cue from reality and then create something else. But the drone shots are still full of reality. Every, everything that's in them is real they haven't been turned into something else it's just the way that you're seeing them so just like uh, it's a different way of seeing them so it's a, I think it's a nice way to to think of them a little bit differently so this is uh, Robin's image 2019 I think down at the same salt works and what you're looking at here is um, uh, the light brown in the middle is like a levee wall and uh, the red uh, on the bottom side is um, uh, the residual uh, salt and then uh, what happens is that uh, they drain the water off the shallow salt pond, let it flow out, let the salt uh, dry, and then harvest the, uh, the salt crystals from what is on the red side. And what we've got here is the little levee where the water is let out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the salt lake, and it's created uh, like a, a little tree on the, uh, on the lee side, on the lower side of the, on the levee. Uh, so... Uh, there are again things you can't see from the ground and things that um, unveil themselves as you're, uh, as you're flying around. There's another uh, little shot. I've probably blown it, blown it up from a, a, a lesser resolved image, but you also get the lovely patterns that, uh, that nature creates. So if you, if you love your landscape photography, uh, then getting into, uh, into a position where you can uh, essentially be be showing Mother Nature at her creative best is a lot of fun because essentially you, in, in some ways, uh, are just recording what, uh, what Mother Nature as the artist has created. And I think the creative part of that is just how you display it, how you frame it, how you trim it. But the actual work itself isn't really, uh, 
isn't really yours. It's uh, it's a matter of recording, and depending on your uh, your appreciation of the natural order, um, that's either uh, good or limiting. Uh, this is an image from um, over in New Zealand, which uh, which has been doctored quite some, uh, but uh, but it started off life as a uh, as a glacial outflow from uh, uh, running down the uh, the gravel beds and the water was green but it was more of a murky green and it was picking up silt on the edge which was kind of a yellow and then I have uh, just mucked around with the colour colour palette to uh, to go ballistic on the greens and the yellows and the uh, the reds of the uh, of the willow trees that were um, were coming into uh, bud at that time of year so um, I'll show you a little bit of that later but it's it's um, essentially what we're, what we're doing here is we're using the base image from uh, the drone to capture uh, the pattern, the shape, the texture, and then uh, using Photoshop to then muck around with the, uh, the colour palette uh, to then create a, uh, a work which is reminiscent of the original, but just takes the original and uh, takes it somewhere else. Uh, this is an, another one um, which was taken on a recent down to Sea Lake in May, in between lockdowns. And uh, I've got an image similar to this, which we can process later. But these are um, uh, these are spots on the Salt Lake where the water is percolating to the surface, and it leaves these um, these drainage uh, marks in amongst the salt. And there again, um, this exercise is really using the natural image to create the uh, the shapes, the patterns, the textures, and then uh, playing with the colours and the saturations and the uh, dodging and burning to then create uh, an artwork which is an extraction of uh, uh, from the original. And these sorts of things where you can create your own little landscapes. All right, so this is again at the salt lakes. This is a junction between between two salt pans, one where, where they've built up like a little shallow wall. Um, the wall is only probably about two feet high. And uh, what's on the top, we can read a sky What's on the bottom, we, or, you know, we can read like a, a parched, sort of um, muddy, uh, textured uh, horizon and then uh, the blue of the water down below, but that's, a, that's essentially two, uh, two lakes butting up to each other and the, the patterns that result from the, uh, the various movements of the water and the salt. And an, another one of Rob's. So if you're into, um, into seeing things in nature, so... A lot of uh, Mika Boynton's aerial work, she, uh, she looks for things in nature as a uh, sort of an unveiling process, seeing hearts and, and different, uh, different shapes and patterns. In this instance, uh, Robin's been able to capture the angel of the salt lakes. So I'm not sure if it's an angel or a dove, but either way it seems to have some wings and uh, it's certainly got some, uh, some, uh, some textures and some things going on there. So, so once, you've, once you've seen... Um, seen something in the landscape you then process it in a way that then highlights and draws that out so that'll then be a, a, a means of uh, sort of changing the the, uh, the contrast the brightness enriching colors and then uh, just uh, accentuating the uh, the image of, uh, of the thing that you've seen in the landscape so composition how do you go about composing with a drone well, I've got um, a little video here and uh, you'll see uh, this is flying over some of the salt lakes and um, if you just sit and watch it, this is from about uh, maybe 60 to 80 metres up um, and uh, you'll see uh, essentially what I'm doing as I'm moving the drone around is I'm playing with the composition in the viewfinder um, of the, uh, the screen that I'm watching the drone fly with. So... Um
The little uh, glitchy movements are when the focus is happening. So I tend to always focus between every shot. So just for reference, see on the left there, the shadows are blue. Right, so they tend to, um, shadows tend to always be blue because of the, uh, the sky reflection. And any of the whites um, on the ground tend to take on a, um, a, uh, a blue as well. So down at ground level, they're, because uh, they're just reflecting the sky. set of tyre tracks running through the, uh, through the salt lake. All right, so, um, so the equipment, what do we use? So um, I've got two drones. Um, the first one I bought was the, uh, the one on the left, which is the, both part of the, uh, the Chinese offering on the market. So they're both made by DJI, both Chinese drones. Um, but they, uh, DJI seems to have a, a corner on the market for the, for the quality and the, and the features that are available. So, um, so they still lead the marketplace for their drones. Um, so uh, the one on the left was the, uh, the first one I bought, which is called a Phantom 4 Pro. Um, and it's a, it's a larger drone. Uh, it's got fixed chassis, uh, if you like. And uh, the, the, uh, it's got a gimbal and the, the camera hangs uh, from, uh, from below. Uh, you can see on the side that uh, there's a spot for a micro SD card and a, uh, a little uh, micro USB port there for being able to talk to the drone and download information. And then I've got um, a smart controller, which is, the, uh, which is the beast down in front with a little blue screen. And that's the actual controller itself. And... The smart controllers, its virtue is that it's a very bright screen, so um, some of the, the handsets have a, a phone that you can put in them, uh, but the, the phone isn't sort of geared for looking at in bright uh, sunlight, whereas these screens um, are a much brighter screen, so you're able to, uh, to see what you're doing um, with, uh, with the brighter screen. And then, uh, so that's got a one-inch sensor. As I say, it gets about a 20-megapixel shot, um, but up to 40-odd, uh, depending on what you're doing. And then the second one um, I got, uh, because at the stage when I bought the white one, the origami folding ones weren't available. Um, so I then progressed to the, uh, the Mavic 2, which is the one on the right. And it's the only Hasselblad camera I'm ever going to own. So uh, that's one of the other, the other bits of fun with it, is it's got its one inch sensor again. It's got the Hasselblad uh, camera and uh, it's got a slightly different way that it calibrates colour. So the images I get out of the Mavic Pro 2 are, are different to the, what I get out of the Phantom 4. Uh, the Phantom 4 uh, is, a slight, is a bigger drone, longer blades. Uh, it, I get a little bit more range out of it, so I can, I can fly in heavier winds, I can fly further with it. Uh, but the virtue, which you can see with the Mavic 2, up in the top right there is that origami's up, folds up, I can put it in my backpack or in my carry-on luggage, so if I'm travelling with it, um, I can do that readily with the Mavic 2, um, but I, it's a bit hard with the Phantom. So the, the Phantom 4 is actually my preferred drone. I actually prefer flying it over the Mavic 2, um, but I take the Mavic 2 with me for travelling purposes. But if I'm in a car travelling around the state, then I, I will take my Phantom 4 Pro with me as well and drag that and hop out of the car 
with it already charged. So um, uh, swings and roundabouts, but the quality of the image uh, is pretty much the same between the two. Uh, slight subtlety in colour difference with the Hasselblad camera um, and uh, uh, much more manoeuvrable because it's a smaller drone and uh, you can pack it up and carry with it. Um, this is the sort of a snapshot of the screen. So if you're wondering about what you can do and what you can control and what you see, so on those, um, on those smart controller screens, if we take it along uh, the very top, so it's got a GPS uh, system and it, um, it calibrates itself to the GPS every time it flies and depending um, on the drone and what it does, you've got to do the, uh, the drone dance uh, every now and again because you've got to calibrate the compass if you move to a place where the where the uh, it's a new GPS location and so you've got to you know you've got to turn the drone and a couple of different axes and 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 set the compass when you arrive at the new place but across the top um, you can see next to where it says active track there's a little um, uh, set of bars with 12 um, so in this instance uh, this is 12 satellites that's connecting to and um, to fly GPS, um, you've got to have a minimum of four. Um, and most times that I fly, uh, it's usually about six to eight to ten, somewhere in there. So you've, you've usually got quite a number of satellites that it's talking to. Um, across the top, you can see how good the battery is, 61%. You can tell what, what network it's, uh, it's talking on. And then you've got the ability to either go automatic with the camera or you've got all the manual controls that you want to do. So down below that, in this instance, we've got an ISO 400. You can set the shutter speed, you can set the f-stop, you can ex exposure, compensate, you can change the white balance. Uh, the 4K is the video option. You've got the ability to, uh, to choose uh, how you want to fly. So all of this is on the screen. So whilst you're flying, um, you've got all these controls at your fingertips. All right, down the bottom uh, left, uh, we've got H 15.7 and D 24. So it actually tells you where the drone is in relationship to you. It uh, tells you how fast it's flying, the VS, one metre a second. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you've got the ability to uh, swap and change between uh, video and still. Um, so there you can see where you've got the arrow swapping between uh, still camera and the video. If you touch that little spot, you can swap between video and still. And the what is the red button now becomes the um, uh, your button for taking the photo. Or you do have, actually have buttons underneath the controller itself where you can control that. And those little three um, symbols underneath the 2 minutes 23, uh, if you go into that, that's where you can then manually change the settings for... Uh, the ISO, the shutter, and all of the rest. So, um, uh, and then the most important bit um, over on the left is the H button, which is if you get yourself in trouble, you hit that and it returns home. So, um, so, so you got uh, all those controls on the screen, um, and uh, you can make it as manual as you want, as automatic as you want, um, and uh, they're lots of fun and pretty foolproof these days. So if you get yourself to a point where you say, oh, God, I really want to buy a drone, um, these are probably the three at the moment that you look to, and it really depends on, um, on what your budget might be. So the DJ, DJI Mini, you can get one of those, you get into one of those for $750, $749, and uh, the Mavic 2 Pro, which I've got, I think is about $1,800. Yeah, so it's somewhere around 1800 and the DJI Air 2S, you can see there, is uh, 1699 1700 So um, very little difference between the Air 2S and the Mavic 2 Pro now. Um, so the, uh, uh, the Air 2S is the latest and greatest, and um, hot off the press, apparently they're releasing the Mavic 3 in November. So we'll wait and see what that's got in store. Um, so essentially it comes down to what you want to photograph, how detailed an image you want to get. So it's the, kind of the choice of whether you use a camera as a micro two-thirds camera or whether, whether you want a full-frame camera. That's the choice between uh, a Mini 2 and an Air 2S uh, because you go from a, a two-thirds sensor to a one-inch sensor between the Mini 2S and the Air 2S 
and that's essentially a thousand bucks. All right, so so that's the choice between those two. But but uh, state of the art, bang for your buck. These are the three drones that you would currently consider. On each of those, you can see that there's a a fly more combo. That's where they supersize you. All right, so um, so the mini, for instance, is seven forty nine, but the fly more combo is nine forty nine, and the fly more combo you get a couple of extra batteries and a bag and all the little accessories. So if you bought the other bits separately. Uh, it's more expensive than the uh, than the two hundred dollars they're charging you, and the same with the uh, the Air Two S sixteen ninety nine. It comes with one battery and sort of the stripped down version. But if you want all the extra batteries and all the other bits that they give you, then it's about twenty one hundred instead of seventeen hundred. So they they get another four hundred dollars out of you. So ten top tips. So capture tips. Um, when you're flying, it's kind of like when you're using your, using your camera handheld or tripod or the like. You, you've got to keep it still. You've got to come to a stop. If, you take, if you're flying along and you take a shot, you're probably going to get some motion blur. So always stop to, uh, before you take your shot. Dynamic range of the cameras isn't fantastic. So you saw in that, in that first image with the water washing over the rocks where it had troubles with the, uh, with the white. It was just too bright and it couldn't get the range between the darks and the lights. And once you put the sun in there, it just doesn't deal with the sun very well. So polarising filters work really well with, with the drones. And there again, it depends which way you got to... So when you set the polarising filter up, you then got to manually choose which way the, um, the drone is facing to get use of the polarizer. All right. So that... So that you then uh, spin the drone on the spot to get the to get the adjustment on the polarizer to get the best effect. So then you're you're playing around with spinning the drone, fixing the composition. So you, you're thinking about a, a few few things uh, at the same time. One of the tricks with um, abstracts, which you could see by uh, that little short video, is that you've you've got to give up on your own perception of what you want to see, and just look at what the screen is showing you and only respond to what the screen is showing to you. So, so you've got to, um, uh, in some ways, you've got to end up putting yourself inside the, uh, the camera of the drone and take what it sees and manipulate it rather than have any preconceptions as to, uh, as to what you're going to capture or what you want to see. Um, you've got to work with the tool as, a, as opposed to uh, against it. And cloudy days are definitely better for capturing things. All right, so you get rid of all the highlight issues. Uh, the shadows aren't as dark and the colours are better. So uh, just the nature of the camera and uh, what the camera can capture, you uh, do better on a cloudy day. And the images I'm going to have a play with in a minute are all captured on a cloudy day, and you can see uh, why, why that is better. And um, some of the post-processing tips. So um, as you saw in those images, if you've got something that's white, it's going to reflect the sky, which means it's going to end up having a blue, a blue haze on it. And, and cyan tends to play a big role in how you are processing the images. You've got to deal with the cyan in the image, so you either love it and work with it, um, or if you don't like what the cyan's doing, then you've got to drop it out and, um, and find a way of working without the cyan. And uh, I think you saw in that other image where, uh, because of the sky reflection again, shadows are usually blue, which is is a bit weird then again if you're trying to compose and working with the colour in the image because we don't often, as landscape photographers, work with blue shadows. Um, but uh, they're definitely much more pronounced blue. One of the little processing tips I'll show you is in that section you've got to neutralise um, neutralize the white uh, in Photoshop, which, is, which kind of fixes up the first two, six and seven. So I'll show you that. You go into image, adjustments, match color, neutralize. When you sharpen, uh, selectively sharpen. And when you saturate, selectively saturate. So don't do it to the whole image. So especially um, if you're creating the various works, you've got to, um, you've got to work with the image to uh, just highlight areas of it and not do global adjustments. You've got, it's a much more um, a selective way of processing. Um, and as a final little page, if, you, if you're into looking at lots of different images, if you haven't, uh, haven't been uh, to this site, uh, this is an annual competition run by the Siena International Photography Awards, and they have a drone uh, photo award each year, and you can go to this website and they've just run uh, that competition, so uh, there's some current images 
which are fantastic uh, quality, which you can see what people are using their drones for. Uh, so the drone awards dot photo. And as I say, I think they've got the top 10 in each of those categories. If you go to the abstract section, uh, you'll f find that one of mine taken on the on the Salt Lake is in the uh, in the abstract category there. So uh, I was able to get it commended this year in in the Drone Awards. All right. So um, what I might do now is take unless there's some questions on that. I was just going to uh, show you a couple of images and then have a go, go at processing them, and you can sort of see uh, what I do and how I do it. They're essentially an unmanned aircraft, right? So if you go to the trouble, essentially a pilot's license, uh, you can then um, ring up air traffic control, you can book a flight path, you can fly wherever you want to fly. You can fly in Sydney Harbour if you have that license and if you contact air traffic control and book your flight. A couple of friends down the south coast and they regularly are in contact with... Um, air traffic control at the naval air base and they uh, they book their 15 minutes or their half an hour they book their flight part and they can fly in all the restricted areas um, as long as they have um, um, made contact and gone through the due process um, so the same applies to sydney harbour so if you can fly a helicopter down sydney harbour uh, you can fly a drone if you've got the proper licence, and the, uh, but essentially Sydney Harbour, um, if you look at the air traffic control maps, is a no-fly zone. It's a controlled airspace, and uh, unless you have permission from CASA, you cannot fly there. So that's um, a straight out of camera, and that I think that's the Mavic Pro that's, that we've got there, um, and uh, this is down at Sea Lake, uh, down in Victoria, a bit like that other shot that. Uh, we had the video of this is just a section where um, uh, it's the water flow coming into uh, Sea Lake. So when we were there last time in May, um, uh, very dry. Um, there's only a little bit of water in the middle of the Sea Lake. Um, at the moment, it's probably about a metre deep, so all of this would be underwater. So it's, it's constantly uh, uh, coming and going, and that's what uh, brings the salt out and washes the salt and creates all the magic patterns. So in this instance, uh, the brown is mud, uh, you get a, get a little bit of pink um, happening and that's the little bacteria that uh, gets in the, uh, in the salt. And uh, the white is, um, uh, of course, the salt and the patterns in between. Uh, and we've got the choice of the optic panel. So one of the fun parts in the optic panel is that when we click remove chromatic aberrations, I can also click use profile corrections and this is the one and only time I can go and tick Hasselblad. And it, <laughs> it comes up with my, uh, my Hasselblad profile for my lens profile. And I'm not sure if you saw much, but there's uh, not too much is done there. But uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a distortion. And the only other thing I'm going to do in basic is hit auto. And as you can see, that's really just increased the contrast, dehazed it a bit. Um, and... Uh, just drag the highlights up a bit and increase the shadows a bit. All right, so at this stage, uh, that's great um, because it's given a bit more definition to the image. So we will uh, open that. So Control J, copy the layer, and then um, that little trick I was I'm telling you, if we go up to Image, Adjustment, uh, down a match colour and then down here we've got the little box we can tick which essentially is neutralised that will deal with the whites. All right, so you can see what it's done, it, it's actually given it a, uh, a blue cast. All right, but we will deal with that um, later in the processing. So one of the interesting things is that uh, the reason I do that now is that by neutralising uh, the whites the curves adjustment, which I'm about to do, is a lot, lot, uh, it's a lot more graphic, there's a lot more colour, and there's a lot more uh, interesting things happen. So let's have a look. So if we come down to uh, a standard curves layer, uh, if I hit uh, auto, 
you can see it's starting to really crank things up. If I hit my Alt plus Auto and get to the other algorithms, we're going to get some interesting things happening here. So if we go Enhance Monochrome Contrast, that takes us back roughly to uh, where we were before we started. You can see up in the histogram where essentially what is done with the blue channel, uh, it, it's pinched the blue channel into the histogram, so it's, it's brought it in uh, and adjusted the blue channel. So that's essentially what that, uh, what that has done there. But uh, have a look at what the others ones will do. So if we enhance per channel contrast, look at the, uh, the, the mauves and the purples and the interesting colours that are coming out now. Or we go to a combination of dark and light where we end up with a bit of a combo uh, of the effect. And if we just do brightness, it's very similar to Enhance monochromatic contrast. But if we can also do snap midtones, which tend to bring a little bit of green in, so you can see where the green uh, gets boosted with the, uh, the neutral midtones. But let's choose that one and uh, start with that. So you can see the difference, all right, even with the curve. So there's our original image. Just look what, uh, and look at also what the uh, the histogram's doing, where it's pinched the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel. And it's adjusted those uh, to create this new colorway. Yeah. So I've got um, all sorts of uh, things we can do with this. So uh, we can go to brighten and contrast. So often I would just play with this just to see what this does. So you can see just by darkening how it brings out. Um, just the detail on the salt there, up on the top. So we're only looking at this area up on the top of the picture. Um, you tend to need to break it down into areas that you're looking at. And then if you increase the contrast, it's almost like uh, looking down on a glacier. All right, so we can crank uh, that up there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, control I, invert that change, uh, B for brush, I uh, get myself a uh, soft brush, 30% opacity, 50% flow. Uh, it's a little bit small at the moment, slightly bigger brush, and then I can uh, essentially brush that in to the area up the top there to pick up that extra detail uh, that that was providing me. I right, might do a little bit darken those edges there to keep the eye in the middle. So any of you who are doctors, I'm not sure if Mark's with us, I'm sure he can, you can see a hand bone or a foot bone or something in that, uh, in that ice combination there we've got. It's actually like an MRI image of a foot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Broken foot. <laughs> That's right. So uh, this is the broken foot image of uh, Sea Lake. Um, so, so we, I didn't mention there. what species. <laughs> <laughs> Is it human? Um, so you can see at the moment um, the colour issues, the blue is actually sky reflect. So we've got to choose what we're going to do with that. So uh, because at the moment there's some quite nice other things happening, but I'm not sure whether the blue helps or hinders. So let's have a look at the blue. So if we go into um, hue and saturation, and then I click on the little picker here and I come across and I choose one of the blues and if I click and hold, if I drag to the left it desaturates it, if I drag to the right it saturates it. All right, so if I can desaturate the blue to get the, uh, the sky reflection off the salt, that's a start. I can then choose maybe another section of the blue, there will be different blues and that will sort of change that. So if you, if you don't like the, the blue um, sort of aberration that's being created, that's the way that you could manage that. And then the other thing that you um, can have fun with is the same with another hue and saturation layer. If we go and grab that picker again, see how there's this little bit of pink that's running around on the ice, on the, the ice, on the salt. Uh, so if we click on the pink and hold it and drag it to the right, we can increase the saturation of that and you can see that the pinks and the reds tend to start popping out in the salt. 
or we can choose the yellows to bring up the vibrance of the yellow. Right, so we end up, uh, we can start playing games with uh, the colours. Um, if I do another one uh, with uh, hue and saturation, I can actually use the picker to choose the colour. All right, so let's say, let's choose this yellow. And then up the top with the hue slider, if I slide that left and right, I can actually change the hue of the yellow all right, that I've selected. So if I want to start playing around with making it a little bit redder, then I can turn the yellows a little bit redder. Or I can come down here and I can pick this, this pinky brown there and I can uh, change its tone and drop it back so it's not pinky brown and it blends into the background or I can move it the other way and I can make it hot mm. pink. All right. So, so you end up, um, it's as if you uh, had your paintbrush out and you had painted your scene and then you want to change some tones in it. So it's fantastic because you can go back and revisit uh, areas of the picture. All right, so at, th at this stage we're working with the whole image. We haven't even played with composition because we've tried to get a kind of interesting composition uh, with, uh, in camera. But if I want to play with the composition, so let's stamp all those up. Magic shortcut, control, alt, shift, E. Um, and I come up here to um, uh, image rotate. And what, what happens to my perception of the image as I move it around? Um, do I like it one way or another? Uh, do I kind of like it that way? That's kind of not bad. Um, or um, I could uh, choose to do it uh, a different way in that I can choose the crop tool and you can see with the crop tool with the arrows I can actually hold and drag and I can rotate the image this way. So if I wanted to, for instance, maybe get this a little bit more squared up and get that sitting in the middle, I could do uh, something like, uh, like that with the crop. And then Mark's going to say, you've got a black corner there. What are you going to do with your black corner? So I come up here to my um, lasso tool and I lasso around here and I right click and I fill and I fill content aware and it makes up some pixels to blend in with my little black corner. Control D gets rid of the marching ants. Um, I've also got the ability which you saw the other day where I can play around with <coughs> the uh, stretching and um, and just the, uh, the uh, geometry of the image. So at this stage we might go to um, it's edit, transform, warp. And I can uh, play around with these points on the edge of the, uh, of the image and stretch and manoeuvre. Right? So I can sort of say, well, actually I'd like this to open up a little bit more and have that pattern come over here a bit. Or I really wouldn't mind that being a little bit further across there or this being up there a little bit. Um, or, or I'd like this to come right out of the corner. Um, there's not too much happening here, so let's stretch the image across and lose a bit of that. Um, or if I want to move this around and play with just the geometry that's within the image itself. All right, so that's at the kind of stage where you might do that. Um, and uh, we can then play with some other cool little tricks. So I might just uh, copy that because we've stretched it. So we'll do a um, Control-J again. So we've got a copy which we can play with. Um, and if I go up to um, Image, Apply Image, uh, what this does is it takes the image and puts it on top of itself again and, uh, and darkens it but creates some pretty grungy, interesting effects. So let's have a go. All right, so you end up with... Um, some quite interesting uh, changes in the graphics. Um, you can see up here in the um, in the uh, the little uh, 
dialogue box that it's it's doing that to the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. Uh, so what I can do is do be selective. I can say, well, just do it to the red channel, and you can see where that becomes more of a a grey uh, version of uh, of what's happening. Uh, the green channel um, sort of leaves the yellows alone a bit, and the blue channel um, uh, also uh, tends to brighten the yellows a bit. All right, so we might actually do a don't mind the green one. All right, so let's try uh, the green one. Uh, I will put a mask, so I come down the bottom with my little Japanese flag without the red dot. Uh, put a mask on it. I go Control I and I invert that. I get uh, B for brush. I've got a black mask. I want a white brush. And then what I can do is I can brush some of that extra detail on that the um, that, that provides me that uh, that multiply option. So I can actually bring out the detail uh, using using the multiply effect that has occurred. All right, so so that if I turn that on and off, that's just given me, um, you know, it's essentially created a vignette around the edge, which has given me some detail whilst I've been doing the vignetting um, and uh, sort of brings out that detail and, uh, and the like in there. So um, one of the other things we can do, we looked at, um, at luminosity uh, masking uh, the other day, didn't we? So if we stamp all that up, if I have a look in uh, channels and I have a look at my blue channel, you can see that that's, that's an interesting kind of mask of the dark and the light areas. All right, so I can uh, create myself Create myself a duplicate blue channel. I can, uh, if I highlight it, I can come down here with my little European Union circle and select all the bits. I can go back to layers and with that selection, I can create, let's put it in a brightness and contrast layer. Uh, if I go back to channels, I can turn that off and we get back to the original image. So um, what, what I can do um, with my mask on this now is I can selectively brighten and dark uh, the bits uh, that the mask had. So when I'm brightening and darkening this it's only affecting the, the highlights or um, if I come across here and I go control I and invert the mask um, I can um, brighten and darken the bits between the whites which are the darks. Right, so I've got a way of, of selectively brightening, um, uh, say, the sand down the bottom. So this yellow bit of the sand is quite nice being brightened up. So what I might do is um, brighten the sand like that. And then I can either paint out this mask, which we might do. So if I use a, um, a, a black brush... brush off the effect on the light bits and keep the effect on the yellowy sandy bits that we've brightened to get a little bit more uh, detail out of the, uh, the sandy bits. All right, so you can see what that's done with the mask. So if I go um, alt-click, you can see what the mask looks like. Um, and if I turn that on and off, you can see where I've been able to just brighten those areas where there's a bit of colour which we might want to bring into the picture. Right. And then I suppose as a final little touch we might do for this if we go to our levels. Um, you can see with the histogram that it's really quite spread out to the edge but if we pinch the blacks in a bit we'll get a little bit more grunt out of the shadows and if we pinch the white in we'll get a bit more brightness in the image. Alright, so we've been able to go from that to that.
gives you the ability to look at things differently, but it also gets you to look at how you photograph differently too. You know, your preconceptions as to what you're trying to capture, why you're trying to capture it, how you're going to capture it, how you're going to share that, if that experience with someone else, um, and just it informs your other photography as well. So it's kind of an interesting experience because it's quite a departure from normal photography, um, but it also gives you a, uh, a great insight into the, uh, the image making that you're doing. Essentially, I think as we move forward in photography um, and the technology keeps changing, uh, that um, uh, video, I think, will be um, more integral to what we want to do. Yeah. Right? So if you think about the technology as, as it has developed, um, uh, the ability to capture time and capture a moving image uh, has been difficult. Um, but it's getting easier and the size of the files are getting smaller. And if I just want to take myself, you know, you just got to look at what is happening with the iPhone 13 and I can take my video. I've got three different cameras I can take my video with. I can immediately post it on my vlog or on my Facebook or on wherever. And if I'm trying to um, engage with someone else and show them something that I have experienced, then even being able to share a video or a short um, snippet of a video is a much more engaging thing than a still image. All right? And there's times for a still image and there's times for an image which has time and motion in it because it tells more about the subject. All right? So what the, what the drone does is because you no longer look at the world the same way that you do walking down a street because you're at a different height or you're at a different um, you know, angle or location, it immediately changes the way you look at the world because you're looking at the world from a different vantage point. So not only do you as the person operating the bit of equipment look at the world differently, but the equipment can actually look at the world differently for you and create those opportunities to create images which are new and interesting uh, because they're not the way that we've seen them before. And that's, I think, the big attraction of the of the drone image is that it's giving that uh, that unique engagement with the world which has previously been difficult to get unless you owned a helicopter licence or... That um, processing, Tim, was really quite something I've never seen. Most of those things that you use going into that deeper level amazing or it was quite amazing what you could pump out of it if uh, bresson had the multi-shot camera all right what would he have produced all right would he have still been freezing time like he did or if he had a movie camera would he still be uh, uh, photographing the same way that he did so um, it's a bit like people have that argument about ansel adams about you know doing things the way that ansel did in the dark room but um, uh, there's lots of information about you know, him seeing the digital age coming along and you can imagine the games and things that he'd be playing with because I think anyone at the, uh, at the forefront of manipulating images and creating images wants to do lots of interesting stuff so he wouldn't be holding back in the digital age, would he? He'd be wanting to explore all the different options because once you've got the creative mind, you just don't, you're not set by, uh, uh, by uh, doing things just because that's the way you do them. You want to start exploring all different ways of creating interesting things. So uh, you're not going to be limited by, uh, by the techniques. It's just that at the time Bresson was doing his, uh, his frozen moments, that's all his equipment could do. <laughs> and it was perfectly suited for making frozen moments. Congratulations. It's been a, a, an aw absolutely awe-inspiring awe uh, presentation. Uh, I've been flying drones for a long time and... I'm totally blown away by your development skills in, in Photoshop. Yeah. You transformed them uniquely. Congratulations. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> One of the things that spurred me on uh, for, uh, uh, for developing um, the drone was that the only other option for a photographer is to go and pay thousands of dollars to sit in a light plane with the doors off, all right, to go flying oh. somewhere. So... You know, you can you can do it in Sydney Harbour. You can you can hire a um, helicopter doors off, do the flight around Sydney Harbour with your full frame camera to take the pictures, and you can go and do the same sort of thing around Lake Eyre 
spend your 10 grand on airfares and come back with some you know interesting images um, so uh, the challenge I really set myself was um, you know, a drone is affordable all right so so if you think you know Peter Eastway sits in the back of his uh, of his doors off camp uh, um, a plane at uh, however many thousand feet with his 100 megapixel camera all right I'm at 100 meters with my 20 megapixel camera which means I'm getting more detail than he is with his 100 megapixel at 3,000 feet right so so technically I should be able to get an image as good as Peter does sitting up in his aeroplane or Paul Holland or or Tom Putt or whoever's sitting in their aeroplane so um, the, the challenge I set myself, which is why we we've, we've keep on visiting um, Salt Lake, was that um, I can go and spend 1500 bucks on a drone, um, drive for a day to Sea Lake, um, and uh, go and fly my drone at no cost except the electricity to recharge the batteries and come on home. Right? And so for an, an event, even if I bought the drone and factored that in, for $2,000, I can get this. Could I get the same images as paying ten thousand dollars and going flying with Peter or Tom over over uh, over Lake Eyre? Right? And I think uh, you will agree that I've been able to do for a fraction of the price um, and have the same experience and engagement with the landscape and have fun, which I can share with other people. So that so that um, the whole idea of, of pushing the, the the drone was an affordable, reachable um, way where people can still get the same experience of um, engaging with the landscape in a unique way and exploring bits of Australia at the same time without having to throw lots of money at it. Um, so, so that's been the motivation, and uh, and hopefully the more we do and the better we look, make the images look, the more people will be convinced. Well, I don't have to be uh, in the back of a light airplane to to um, take great photographs. Yeah. Um, I can do the same with my, uh, with, my, with my little drone. Yeah, and it's repeatable. If you don't get what you want one day, you can go out the next day and it's not costing you another $10,000 flight. That's right, precisely. Yeah. And, and all um, with a Hasselblad camera. That's <laughs> right, my, my $1,800 Hasselblad camera. <laughs> but, but also the $1,800 is then amortised over all your visits. All right, so... I've owned that drone now for what, three or four years, all right. So the number of flights I've done with it is probably costing me about ten bucks a flight, all right. And uh, the problem I've got is storage space. It's costing me a fortune in in hard drives. <laughs> yeah. Tim, the other big advantage you get you don't you don't have to be trying to explain to a chopper pilot or a plane pilot what the hell you're trying to photograph and what you'd like him to do. Yeah. And, and the other big thing, which you could see in that, um, that little video I did, was that you can take your time, yeah. all right? So you can, just, you can just sit and dream and spin on the spot. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, much more, um, it's much more low stress, all right? So you get your chance, you're flying along, you get one go at taking the shot, and you've, you've got to have your decisive moment when you're in the plane because you miss it. All right. Whereas, whereas with your drone, you can sit and dream, you can play around, you can come back the next day. Uh, you know, you might wait for a cloudy day so you don't have all the sun interfering. So, so it's much more controllable, um, much more leisurely, um, and uh, I think it it enables your the dreaming process to happen. All right, and uh, those creative moments just need time, mm -hmm. and the fact that you can just sit and hover. And just explore one spot for half an hour with your uh, with your drone. Um, you can you can essentially dream away, and it's it's fantastic um, taking all the pressure off. Um, you know, paying your ten grand, got to get you know where are we going to go? What if it's not right? Am I going to blow my money? All that sort of stuff. All of that's out the window, and all you're concentrating on is about just you know enjoying the landscape, looking at the compositions, you know. Flying mm. over, flying back, you know, much, much more, um, much more uh, intuitive, creative process. The quality and detail of the images out of a drone um, will be as good as any Paul Holland shot or any Peter Eastway or Tony Hewitt 
you can get the same amount of detail. Uh, what you can't do is the range. So you can't go and fly for three hours out somewhere that's uh, very remote. Uh, you've got to get yourself to the place if you want to do those. Um, but that's also part of what we did with exploring Sea Lake was that um, you don't have to drive into the middle of Australia. There's lots of places around and it's just a matter of looking with fresh eyes at stuff that's already here. Um, so one of, one of the things that we often do when we travel is I, I get out Google Earth all right, and I look along where we are going to be travelling and you'll be surprised about the number of things that are just on the other side of the hill when you're travelling between places. And if you do your Google Earth search and you stop at the right place, then these drones have, um, uh, depending on the drone, so my white one will fly um, happily five kilometres away. All right. So from wherever I stop, I have a five kilometre radius. So if you think about lockdown at the moment, um, my drone will go as far as I can go in lockdown. <laughs> so if, if you've got a five kilometre radius from where you stop by the side of the road, it is amazing what bits of Australia there are to photograph without having to pay a fortune to go out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, Google Earth is fantastic. Sometimes you need to crank up the shutter speed, so when you go into manual, um, so if it is a windy day, the drone will be doing this. Right? So, so you do, um, uh, on those windy days, you do need to uh, crank up the shutter speed to compensate for any movement that's happening. Uh, just with that image of the, of the water washing over the rock platform. You know? doesn't, doesn't that inform and uh, share an experience of the rock platform which you just can't catch with a still yeah. shot? Mm -hmm. right? That yeah. whole sense of the surge and the flow, and you need a moving image to capture that. Yeah. Right? So, so um, the, the, you know, we may not get in, you know, I don't use my video function on my D850 much, um, I've seen a couple of Peter DeVries's sort of uh, time-lapse sunrises, which look pretty cool, so I might have a go at doing some time-lapses with it, but it's not, it's not something I really rush to as a landscape photographer because I'm, you know, historically we just take the single shot, single point of view, yeah. choose the lens, chase the light, and it's a, it's a frozen shot. But um, if you have a... Um, if you're a Facebooker, go and have a look at um, Peter, so... P-I-E-T-E-R de Vries, V-R-I-E-S. So if you have a look at Peter's um, feed, he um, so he's a cinematographer, so he's got a head start, and he uses his iPhone most of the time, which is even more depressing with the quality of the stuff that he's producing. But if you have a look, he, um, he he's, up, he's usually down at, um, he lives down at uh, Belgola. He's down at the beach for sunrise most mornings, and he posts... Um, uh, time-lapse shots of the sunrise, all right? And um, uh, I don't care how good a photographer you are, if you compare your single, um, single shot uh, sunrise image to his time-lapse, the time-lapse has just got so much more going for it yeah. than the single shot because he gets the sense of movement, he gets the light washing across the clouds, he gets the subtle change in colours... It just it tells the story about a sunrise so much better than one single fixed image. Yeah. Um, so my, it's, my husband uh, does video. So yeah. when we travel, he does video. I do stills. Yeah. But the the memories are so much better with the video, really. Um, uh, they are, and, 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 and I, I think that gets to um, to David Hockney's um, sort of uh, his his comment where. Um, uh, life involves time, all right? Um, you, need, you need time in the event for mm. it to make sense of it, all right? Because it's the change um, that you're responding to, not the, not the frozen moment. Yeah. It's the moments either side of the frozen moment that add the significance. Yes. Right? Because and also the, the point of view, the fact that you can pan around you and... Yeah. And get that whole feeling of um, yeah, of, of other things because of things. because whatever you see is 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 more than just the straight on view. So yeah, you know that that deception that you get looking in the mirror um, because no one ever sees you like that. They're always looking at you sort of sideways or yeah, whatever. So so how you look isn't how we 
how you perceive yourself in a mirror. Mm-hmm. Interesting esoteric stuff. Mm-hmm. It's all it's all informs your image making. Yes. Right? Because if you want to engage with, um, if you want people or the viewer to engage with your image, uh, you've got to understand all this stuff so you know when you're putting it together what people are going to respond to. So instead of it being a mystery as to why people like your shot, <laughs> you need to get to the, the point where you understand why they like your shot so that you can actually factor that into your image. Mm.